Okay, so I would like to uh, to welcome uh, Fred Archibald uh, from Nova Scotia in Canada uh, to uh, talk at uh, Denby Dale Club tonight and a big welcome to all our members and visitors uh, from the UK and uh, other parts of Europe and the world to uh, Denby Dale Radio Club. You're always welcome and will continue to be welcome at our our Zoom meetings, whether or not you're a member of the Denby Dow Radio Club, you can always attend our meetings. We make them free and open to all radio amateurs. Uh, Fred gave us a fantastic talk a few months ago, a couple of months ago, on the Titanic disaster and explained in fantastic detail uh, what the radio equipment was on the Titanic, how it worked, uh, what the uh, the station setup looked like, and he promised he would come back to do the second part of his talk, uh, which which is going to touch on what impact the Titanic disaster had on radio and radio communications. But uh, Fred is 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 going to go back uh, over a couple of things. I know Fred, aren't you? Uh, that uh, that you gave on the first talk. Uh, for those that missed it, and for those that have forgotten it, but uh, from a slightly different angle. So, Fred, I would like to, first of all, I'm just going to put you on spotlight to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to share my screen because I've got your PowerPoint and uh, we can then start off if I can find it. What have I done with my PowerPoint? <laughs> uh, no, please got... don't lose it, Nick. <laughs> I'll try not to, Fred. Um, yeah. Right, hang on a second. We'll get there in a tick. Ah, that looks familiar. You might have, you might recognise this, Fred. There we go. Yes. Okay, Fred. I'll hand, I'll hand the microphone to you, and you can tell me when to move the slides on. Great. Well, thank you so much, Nick, for the nice introduction. And uh, thank you, the rest of you, for coming to uh, look and listen. Uh, perhaps I should just say that uh, a lot of things interest me about amateur radio, but one that's been with me from the beginning is an interest in, in how a lot of the older systems worked. And uh, that's what I spent the first talk on. And here, I'm going to give a brief introduction uh, about uh, how the radio works, because as Nick said, one, for the people who didn't hear the first talk, and two, because I got some very nice uh, CGI, computer graphics imaging uh, pictures of the three rooms of the radio station on the Titanic. They're actually from a fellow named Park Stevenson, who's a friend of James Cameron, who uh, did the latest uh, uh, Titanic movie back in 97, 98, I forget. But uh, anyway, so... Uh, the, these images are based on uh, uh, basically a lot of hard data, exactly what all the equipment looked like and uh, how it was set up in the Titanic, which was unique. It wasn't like that, quite like any other ship. Uh, let me just say first that uh, uh, it, it, you might think that uh, radios had this smooth progression from old uh, uh, Heinrich Hertz seeing a spark on his little 300 megahertz halo to uh, where we are today, but it's, it's not true because early radio uh, lacked two of what we would consider essential things. There was no proper electronic oscillator and there was no electronic amplifier. So everything they did with radio up until uh, the late teens or 1920 had to do without an amplifier or an electronic oscillator. And that's uh, <laughs> those are fairly serious deficiencies if you think about it a bit. So I'll say a little bit about that. And then um, the effect of radio on the disaster. Was radio actually helpful way back then? And two, um, the disaster, of course, was na international news. And did it have an effect on the course of radio, uh, both uh, technically and uh, by regulations and how it's operated? OK, here's the Titanic uh, uh, it's painting, actually, as she, uh, she leaves probably Southampton. Uh, next one, Nick. Okay, here, here she is, as I'm sure you all know. She was a big ship, 53,000 tons, 880 feet long, 92 feet wide, 46,000 horsepower. Uh, interesting enough, actually, you've seen different numbers. Even here, there's so many uh, 
different accounts of the Titanic, some say 50 or 52,000 horsepower. And it all depends on what you assume the steam pressure is. It had one steam turbine and two big triple expansion engines. 2,224 people on board and two radios, the main radio and the backup. Uh, next slide. And here's the antenna, which is kind of interesting in itself. It was, they called it a twin T. And this is looking from below. The antenna, uh, the, the two masts, the four and a half masts are 600 feet apart. And if you look at this, the ends, uh, I can't quite point it out here, but the ends uh, are uh, just tarred hemp. But if you look in, in the uh, antenna, you'll see what look like dog bones, uh, two tiny circles of the dark line in between. Uh, these are insulators. So the actual antenna is four symmetrical T's, 450 feet across the top and 190 feet down to the station, which is on the center line of the ship on the top deck. So it, it's, it's straight down. Actually, the four down leads or down wires are the most functional part of the antenna because uh, essentially that, that 450 foot uh, cross on the top of each of the wires is a, a, a very effective capacity hat reflecting against the steel ship just below. So most of the RF was uh, radiated from the four verticals and what they look like electrically, of course, is a, very, a single very fat vertical, uh, which in fact works very well. The thing, uh, has uh, 2,560 feet of wire in it. So it, it's a substantial antenna. And if you can imagine this out on the Atlantic Ocean, uh, it's a, in a great circle of perfect ground on a steel ship. Uh, the top of the antenna is 250 feet above the ocean and the, the down leads go down to 60 feet above the ocean. So it's, it's a very nice antenna, which if you have no amplifiers in your receiver is a good thing to have. It actually is directional that of course the aft and four masts are on the long axis of the ship and it has quite a bit of gain in that direction. They could tell, it, and that was convenient because you could both keep communicating with the port you just left for quite a ways and you got good communication as soon as possible with the ports you were heading to. The Atlantic was a little too wide for Spark technology. So uh, anyway, we'll talk about the reach of the uh, radio in, in a moment. Uh, the resonant frequency is about 930 kilohertz. Uh, it was mostly used on 500 kilohertz or 600 meters. Uh, the 930 in, at the time was the short wave because people believed that uh, you really couldn't do anything uh, above 1500 kilohertz. Uh, above that was useless. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is a... Uh, eagle's eye view, or more likely a seagull's eye view of the top deck of the Titanic. The bow is on the right, stern on the left. Uh, the three uh, raspberry colored boxes there is the radio installation. The S is what was called the silent room, which had all had the heavy machinery for the transmitter. M was the Marconi room or operating room with the desk and the receiver and, and where the operator sat. And the B was the bunk room. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, as far as I can tell, they uh, it was a hot bunking system. There was two operators and there was one bed, but since somebody had to be on duty all the time, then uh, I guess it worked out and they saved a bed. Uh, before we go, if you look at these green things, they're obviously the lifeboats. And so, in fact, in, in the event, it was rather nice to be right there on the same deck with the lifeboats on the very, at the very top of the ship. You'll notice at the end, at the uh, right hand end, the lifeboats have sort of uh, extra lines in them. And those are what they called the collapsible lifeboats. To make more room, you could stack two or three of these on top of each other. They had a, a conventional wooden bottom, but, but sides that collapsed down so you could stack them up and they'll figure in the story. Uh, next, uh, next slide. Okay, I, I won't, well, I guess I'll go through a little detail. The radio is called a five kilowatt synchronous rotary spark. And uh, it was, uh, of course, the, uh, boat was built in, in uh, Northern Ireland and uh, the radios, uh, the operators were there before Titanic had a radio. The radio showed up. Uh, there was probably an installation engineer, but I haven't read about him or found anything about him. But normally he would come because each ship installation was different. They'd have to find the most appropriate uh, room to put, the, put it in, figure out how they're going to get power to it, the antenna away from it, and an effective ground. Uh, this was done at Harland and Wolf in Belfast, 
Um, and it was operational by 1912. And actually the operators did most of the installation. And so the radio itself, um, this is just a transmitter. The, the receiver was just a passive thing, which literally the receiver took no power and it was always on, if you like to look at it that way, because it had, had no active devices in it. But the power for the uh, transmitter was another story. Ship's power was 100, 110 volts DC. The uh, drive motor for the transmitter took uh, 60 amps at that, so six to six kilowatts in, and it converted it into AC uh, in an alternator connected directly to the, the motor. And you've got 300 volts AC at 17 amps and 420 hertz. And that's where the five kilowatts comes from. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that even the factory knew how much power the thing actually put out on the air, but five kilowatts uh, came out of the alternator. <clears throat> and that's in fact what you keyed. So your key had to handle 300 volts at 17 amps, 420 hertz. Since the 300 volts, I think is, uh, yeah, it should be RMS, then you had about 400 volts plus on, on, the, on the key. So you didn't want to grope for the key in the dark. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's what was keyed. Uh, uh, on the Titanic, they moved ahead a step and they put a relay in so that you're only keying the solenoid of the relay. So you stepped it up from 300 volts to either 10 or 20 kilovolts. And so far, I haven't been able to figure out there was two different spark dischargers available. And I think it depended which one you got. There was, uh, I think, three or four different, if you were cruising your Marconi catalog of the time, then you had a choice of three or four different five kilowatt machines. And I think that it depended on your discharger, whether you, you, you could wire it for either 10 or 20, depending on whether you put the two secondary windings in series or parallel. That went through a rotary discharger, which um, pumped the energy into what they called the oscillatory circuit, which was basically an inductive capacitive circuit, just like a tank circuit today. But because you had no oscillator or os uh, amplifier, then they had to wall up the circuit. It's very, very much like striking a bell with a hammer or a tuning fork on something hard. Uh, you get a ring, and this is what these, uh, this train of sparks did. They took the output, and just as today, um, you had to uh, uh, couple and match the output of the oscillatory circuit to uh, that huge antenna we just described. Uh, it, uh, yeah, it was, it was really very much analogous to a single tube, a one tube or one transistor uh, radio, uh, transmitter, except to put out a bit more power. My guess is that the five kilowatts that was stepped up, the transformer was efficient. The oscillatory circuit was pretty efficient, but the rotary discharger was not. You got a lot of heat, light, and noise out of that. It, it was like lightning. So you didn't need to worry about a side tone. When the key went down, you got this horrendous roar out of the rot rotary discharger. Uh, it has a, I, you can't quite call it a dual bander. It's a, a dual frequency radio because uh, basically you could either set it to long wave, 600 meters, or 325 meters short wave. And uh, in the event, uh, I, I'm sure that the short wave was tested, that it functioned when they did their sea trials, but uh, on, the, on the fatal voyage, it was all 600 meters, 500 kilohertz, which is where most people worked all the time in those days. Uh, the, the receiver was uh, two units which were used very widely, by the way, all this equipment was, of course, built in England by Marconi, uh, part of his enterprise. And there was a multi-tuner, which was a very well-designed uh, device that matched almost any input impedance to any output impedance and had three tuned circuits. And in the middle of it was a second device called the Marconi Magnetic Detector. And it's an interesting device, and I won't get into it, but uh, it's very much like the wire recorder, which was used up in say World War II years as a, a way of recording voice. Uh, the signal was unique. Uh, you couldn't uh, mistake the Titanic's transmitter for anyone else. It had a musical 840 Hertz note. And most in those days, you got a dull unpleasant buzz at 60 Hertz or 120 Hertz, but this was a very different signal. Marconi guaranteed it for 250 miles in the day and at night, it was sort of, you may expect 2000 plus miles, but it's not guaranteed. As most of you probably know, the idea that uh, uh, bands lengthen 
uh, at night isn't just limited to short wave. It works way down here at 500 kilohertz too. Uh, next one, uh, here we go. So if you put your key down with this machine, or actually if you put your key down with what's called a plane spark, the slightly earlier type of receiver, you get this. So this isn't a series of E's or DITs. This is, if you held the key down, this is what you got. Of course, in the center one is what we get today. And the bottom one is what a, uh, a reconstruction of the Titanic synchronous modulated rotary spark would give you. It's uh, the old damped wave was, uh, the engineers realized right away that this wasn't nearly as effective in transmitting a signal as, of course, the, the full uh, clean CW that we use today. So back then, CW didn't come at the beginning of radio. It came halfway along, about 1920. Before that, it was damped wave or plain spark. And uh, this signal, if the peak, the maximum peak was the same on both, you can uh, appreciate that the average energy that you put out was far less than this or even this. And so in the Titanic, they made a great effort to get the, the, the spark frequency up to 840 hertz because the damped wave never completely went to zero. So this, this on the average would have much higher output than the, the damped wave. Okay, next. Okay, now this is the first of uh, this Park Stevenson's uh, CGI. And uh, it, it's actually, it's a nice job. Uh, as you probably know, James Cameron that, that did the Titanic, and I don't know if any of you saw Avatar, but uh, about, anyway, uh, it's, um, it's got wonderful uh, computer graphics imaging. And so this is, everything is, is uh, also there's been a lot of trips uh, in the past few years down to look at what's left of the radio room. So this is the operator's room. Those aren't clocks up there because uh, ships like the Titanic didn't have clocks. Uh, they had usually had two in the, uh, uh, the front of the ship in, in the uh, uh, oh, bridge, sorry, senior moment. Uh, there's two in the bridge, but these are what they were called magneto repeaters because uh, the, the times you read on the quote unquote clocks out throughout the ship uh, where they were simply repeating what had been set in the bridge. Uh, the machines here, the big brass tubes are how you got messages from the purser to uh, the radio office. They had two jobs, I should say, the, the operators. One was make money for Marconi by sending tons of passenger uh, Marconi grams uh, back to uh, Britain or forward to the United States. And that, this was the most profitable part of, of the whole operation. Second was to um, carry out the business of the ship uh, and uh, communicate with other ships that they encountered along their voyage. So uh, these tubes went down to the purser. So you went to him, you wrote out your message to Aunt Bertha to make sure that the, the dog was fed and that was sent back to, through the tube, uh, the paper was taken out. Uh, in front here, you can see the backup coil for the second receiver. And in front of it, there's the two, uh, they used to call them manipulating keys or keys. Uh, and uh, one the one that actually, I think the one on the right was the main one and the one on the left was for the, the auxiliary uh, transmitter. And uh, you'll see on the wall, there's a, a box uh, and that's the, the magnetic detector. Yeah, if you bring the arrow up a little neck there, that, that's the, they called it the Maggie. And it was a clock mechanism which sent a, a, a green silk covered loop of seven stranded soft iron wire through a little set of coils, which uh, would magnetize and demagnetize it. It was a recorder of sorts. And below it is the triple tuner. Uh, and this is uh, what the, the heart of the receiver to the left of the triple tuner is the Fleming valve uh, detector. And this, so, so the, mark, the, the ship had two vacuum tubes and there they are sticking up out of the Fleming valve detector. Um, generally, uh, the operators found that the magnetic detector was much better. So this was probably never used. Okay, uh, next uh, slide. Okay, this is, this is the, um, the transmitter room, the heavy, it was called a silent room and it's lined with extra wood so that uh, the racket from the disc discharger, which is in the far corner of the room, throwing out a, a, a blue, blue glare, that's, that's the discharger in operation. Looking through the doorway, straight through, you actually see the wardrobe in the bedroom, the bunk room, and in the middle is the operating room. And uh, just very quickly, on the wall of the, uh, 
uh, power, uh, power room, the transmitter room here, there's uh, uh, main controls. Uh, you'll see two sets of two meters with big knife switches. First set is for the motor, the second for the alternator. Under it are two big knife switches. The first knife switch, which is down now, uh, is what connects the ship power to the transmitter. And it's, uh, uh, what is wrong with this picture? They made a rather silly mistake here. They show the uh, uh, discus charger spinning up uh, with high voltage sparks. They show a light on the right-hand side, a little light on the wall, which is actually the RF output indicator. This is between uh, the uh, jigger, which picks the power out of the oscillatory circuit and ground. And uh, so this is how, there's no meter. So they, all they know is uh, how bright is the bulb and you adjust everything to get as bright a bulb as possible. I'm sure many of you in the distant past used light bulbs to uh, uh, tune up uh, old uh, transmitters. Well, this was the way to do it back in Marconi's day. Uh, so the uh, motor gen, uh, motor alternators, they're often called an MG set, motor generator set with a disc discharger in the back. The big uh, uh, metal boxes in the middle, uh, these are uh, capacitors, uh, sheets of plate glass with zinc plates in between. Uh, and there's a big switch on top, so you can switch in one, two, or three capacitors. There's a knob on the wall, which is the spiral inductance. And th this is the only way you can tune the, the transmitter. It's basically fixed, and you've got to change some of the taps on those boxes on the wall to get it uh, uh, to move very far in frequency. The big box, uh, the big metal container on the floor is actually the 300 volt to 10 or 20,000 volt transformer. And on the front of it, uh, over the duct boards here, Actually, there's, there's bare studs sticking out. So you wouldn't want to bumble around here in the dark with either 10 or 20 kilovolts there. Uh, okay, uh, a few other things. The, uh, you'll see a hole in the ceiling uh, close to the light bulb. That, that's the antenna. That there's a, and, and above it, uh, there's problems with salt spray, of course, and, and uh, very high voltages. So they have a called a Bradfield isolator, and it, it's about four feet high, and it, it keeps... Uh, that keeps the uh, RF from arcing back to the roof of the, uh, or the, the deck of the ship up there. Um, okay, that, that's, that's enough of that. So th this makes a, an enormous amount of noise. There's a teak box over the disc discharger in, in the corner. And uh, that teak box, uh, oh, on the other side, uh, Nick? Uh, yeah, down here where the blue glow is. Yeah, that, so when it's running, you close that box and that cuts the noise down quite a bit. To prevent the teak box from uh, bursting into flame, it's got an asbestos lining and inside that a lead lining. So you close it and uh, you, uh, anyway, it quiets it down a bit. But th that's your side tone as well as the, the uh, pump that puts energy into the oscillatory circuit. Okay, next slide. Okay, quick, I won't, well, I won't spend any time. This is just a better look at the uh, discus charger uh, on the left, or on the right, excuse me and uh, the um, drive motor and the alternator. And, and uh, uh, anyway, the, the thing in the upper right corner is actually, it, it's, a, it's a series inductor and those are taps. You see those little things projecting. So you, uh, you find the, the tap, which gives you the most RF current and you've, you've matched, uh, matched the antenna. Okay, next. Uh, and here's reality and the CGI. And uh, you may, Actually, you'll notice on this slide, it says proposed recovery object radio equipment. I think this was part of the uh, submission that a group of people made to a court to gain permission to try to uh, rescue this radio, to haul it out of the Titanic. And it, it would have happened by now, except for COVID. So uh, as far as I know, they'll be trying once uh, it, it's, it's possible. Uh, personally, I'm a little sorry. Uh, I think they should leave the thing alone. It, it's it's uh, the resting place of 1,500 people, more or less. Uh, anyway, but uh, they, they didn't ask me. And uh, what I'd prefer is if they, if some enterprising person would try to reconstruct ex the, the machine, the whole uh, transmitting receiving system in, in the Titanic uh, in, in, in a functional form. But anyway, some people want to... There's a big piece of uh, the, the hull of the Titanic in Las Vegas now, and I fear this, uh, what's left of the radio station may join it in Las Vegas. Uh, next slide. 
Okay, quick view overview. You can see the operating room on the left, the uh, transmitter room on the right. Uh, and of course, uh, in case of fire, they have buckets of sand there. You wouldn't want to throw water on the 10 kV uh, transformer. There's a big set of batteries just above the buckets there. And that, that's the backup. Uh, so that if the, the, the power failed on the Titanic, uh, you had four to six hours with your backup transmitter. And uh, okay, I guess that's all we need to see there. You've got a good idea of the, of the transmitter. It, it, uh, next slide, please. Okay, th this is actually Park Stevenson, the fellow who generated these with I think a fair amount of help from, from James Cameron. And he's dr dressed up in a period Marconi uh, a suit. Stand basically, he's in front of uh, one of the CGI's. And incidentally, he went to a lot of detail about the white line across there, the, the lighting, lightning that you see is because there's a, uh, uh, a skylight in there because it's in the middle of the ship. Uh, they didn't want the operators to be operating with, with no daylight. So that's daylight coming in from above. And, oh, incidentally, on the, um, on the right, this device with the, with the handle and all the little studs, that's the soft start for the whole transmitter system. It's very clever. If, if there's excessive voltage or a voltage interruption or excessive current, it automatically switches off. You pull it all the way over, that's your soft start. And it, it, it's held in place by a magnetic force. And, and if uh, uh, any of the above, excess voltage, a voltage gap, or in, uh, excess current happens, then it bang, it, it automatically snaps off and protects the system. Just like many transmitters today, if you were to leave, put a brick on the key and go off for lunch, you'd, you'd burn your, the system up very quickly. Uh, next slide. Okay, these are the two operators, uh, Jack Phillips and uh, Harold Bride. Uh, Jack was uh, uh, the senior and the boss in, in very much. Uh, Harold Bride was really uh, a little bit more than a trainee, but anyway, uh, Jack, uh, even at 25, he had, he had quite a career already. Uh, next, uh, next slide. Uh, he started, he's, he's from Surrey and born in 1887. And he got a job as a post office telegrapher at 15. Uh, I'm not quite sure how the British system worked. I think, I think in fact, he was doing mostly railroad telegraphy, but he worked at that for four years. And then he went to Marconi and trained there. Interestingly enough, Marconi actually charged people who wanted to, to learn how to operate Marconi equipment on ships. So he had to pay uh, to uh, be qualified for a job with Marconi. And he, in fact, was on, he was a radio officer on nine White Star ships, uh, including Lusitania and Mauritania, which you've probably heard of. And uh, I think what they, they wanted to do was uh, uh, they would all have had Marconi radio equipment, but of different vintages and different uh, mixtures. And uh, I, th I think the idea was early in a radio officer's career, he was moved around to all sorts of ships, uh, both to broaden his training and because essentially it was all on a rental basis. The equipment on the ship and the officer who ran the equipment were uh, uh, basically property of Marconi. And uh, if you look at the, the hats, if, if uh, actually just go back uh, for a moment to the, the, the pictures there. If you look at his hat, it looks exactly like a, a White Star uh, ship's officer's hat, except if you'll see there's an M in the middle. And that basically says, I'm, I'm I work for Marconi, I'm paid by Marconi, but of course he was, it was uh, required to follow the orders of the captain of the ship, but he, wa he wasn't normal ship's crew. Uh, back uh, to the, there we go. Uh, so uh, he was a senior radio officer, April 14th, the day before the sinking. Uh, uh, he was very tired, I'll explain why in a moment, but he took a heavy, and but he, nonetheless he took a heavy shift and so he was literally exhausted uh, during the last few frantic hours when the Titanic was sinking. And so he died April 1912 and uh, from exhaustion, hypothermia. Harold Bride was uh, uh, younger. Uh, he actually only completed his training in 1911. So he was actually on uh, four or five ships, five ships uh, before he joined the Titanic in Belfast in, in March. And he and Phillips installed, they didn't just walk in and, and start using the radio. They, they had to install it and test it. Uh, I suspect with the help of a radio engineer. Uh, 
uh, and they shared operating tuning repair and, and all the other duties and uh, he actually a little story I'll, I'll tell he saved Phillips from losing his life jacket uh, in, in the dire last moments of the Titanic uh, next okay I know you can't read this but I just wanted to give you a feel for what the job of a radio officer and at that time was like <clears throat> and so uh, this is from another ship in fact left uh, Liverpool uh, um, on the May 3rd. So it was just a couple of weeks after the Titanic. And the the route would have been exactly the same, the main passenger line from, from uh, Britain to New York. And uh, this this is his log. Uh, on the uh, on the left-hand side are the times. On the right-hand side uh, are the names of either the shore station or the boat. And, and about 90% of them are ships. And uh, so in the course, so this is his whole log from that, from uh, a single crossing of the Atlantic. And so he, he worked about 200 non-passenger, that is none of these are, are messages for the passengers, from the passengers as, as the uh, Titanic uh, sent. But this is just what would happen in the normal course. It, it might be a freight or it might be something or other, uh, but about 200 QSOs. And why did they do them in those days? Well, as you might expect, First problems, major or minor, with either ship. And, and the majority of the ships that you worked, of course, would be going the other way. If you were heading west to New York, you'd be communicating with the ships that pass close to you that were going east back to Europe or the UK. Uh, and of course, uh, they were very useful for uh, weather and sea conditions and hazards. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, in the case of Titanic, uh, Captain Smith heard several days before they got to their uh, fate, uh, that there was a lot of ice in, in the, you know, I don't know if they called it Iceberg Alley in those days, but they certainly knew there was a, a stretch closer to the North American coast where there was a lot of icebergs and they had to watch themselves. So he actually heard uh, through this sort of routine traffic between ships at sea that there, there was quite a bit of ice there. Uh, message relays, um, the, uh, in those days, uh, virtually no ships could cross the Atlantic with their radio unaided. So if you want to get messages, once you are out in the middle of the ocean, once you, if you want to get messages back to Britain or forward to North America, then relays. So you, you'd uh, relay a message to a ship closer than you were, and, and that ship would relay it on and so forth. This developed into quite a system that people have forgotten about that peaked in the 1950s, where if you could be in the middle of the Atlantic and say, I want to talk to my aunt in Honolulu, and it would be relayed to the coast, uh, sent by landline uh, Morse, railway type Morse across the country, um, back on radio and end up in Honolulu. And you could do this on almost any country around the world. It was, a, it was quite a system, not cheap, and it wasn't instantaneous, but uh, you could get messages a long way very quickly. Documented the voyage, all the ships that you would pass, uh, this, this particular ship, and I don't, know, I don't know the name, would have been in the logs of these 200 ship and shore stations. And of course, you were continually checking the propagation and that your radio was working properly. Okay, next slide. Okay, so how did the, the system perform? Uh, uh, they left uh, uh, Belfast on the 2nd of April, and uh, they literally, they had did two days of sea trials it seems strange to me because more recent ships, it could be weeks or months of sea trials. Uh, they found at night, they got some solid contacts with Tenerife and the Canaries of 1900 miles and Port Said 2600 miles away on the Suez Canal. So it worked pretty well at night. And uh, remember, this is with no uh, amplifiers. So when they hear the signal from Port Said uh, in the, the headphones of the receiver, all the energy that their ears are actually hearing came from that generator 2,600 miles away compared to a modern receiver where the energy comes from your power supply and your receiver. Uh, and they found they had consistent daytime contacts with both ships and coastal stations uh, greater than 400 miles. So it was doing its job. Uh, uh, and on the voyage, they of course made uh, uh, correct ship contacts of the, the sort I just described, probably around 200 or maybe a little bit less because they also had to send hundreds of passenger messages uh, to UK shore stations and then to Cape Race, Newfoundland, which would relay them on to the rest of North America. Uh, 
the operators were strongly encouraged to do a good job and get these messages off quickly because this was this was uh, real money for Marconi that they were each message was quite expensive and, and uh, the Titanic sent about 250 of them uh, during the course of its, its short life. Uh, now what happened unfortunately so the the um, operators were very busy uh, they weren't uh, lounging around at all and uh, on the night of 13th of April, this is, uh, the ship went down just uh, at about uh, 2.40 in the morning on the 15th. So this is just a day and a bit uh, before uh, the ship went down. Uh, the radio stopped working. And uh, that, that start switch I mentioned, if you pulled it all away uh, and you let go, it would snap back because it was excessive current flowing. Turns out it was, uh, the high voltage wire, as I say, I don't know whether it was 20 or 10,000 volts in this, uh, this particular version of the radio. Um, so they spent the, almost the whole night uh, trying to fix it. And in the end, it turned out that uh, uh, you'd say, well, you could just follow the wire and see if, if it's shorted somewhere or, or hear a spark. Well, they couldn't hear a spark and they couldn't find any short until they actually opened the high tension transformer. That big tub was filled with a light oil. And I don't know if they had to rummage down in the oil or if the problem was above, but anyway, there was a short in there which they were able to fix and get it back to work. But, but uh, uh, Phillips got no sleep at all and then went right back to work. Uh, he, he told uh, Bride to go to sleep. So Bride slept for most of the 14th of April. He actually woke up almost exactly when they struck the iceberg. And, and uh, because of the, the, the delay, because of the problem, uh, Phillips had this huge backlog of, of messages, passenger messages, trivial messages, you know. And uh, so he was struggling with them and he was getting pretty darn tired. And uh, uh, Bride got up and he felt just the slightest little tug or, or, or erratic movement in the ship. But uh, he said it was very trivial. Uh, you could hardly notice it. And that, that was the uh, iceberg gouging the side of the Titanic. Uh, Oh, and also the performance of this, this setup there, that after striking the iceberg, which is at 2351, uh, the 14th of April, uh, there was, they had good communications with uh, 12 plus ships. They were copied by 24 ships and uh, they communicated with a number of uh, uh, coastal sites, including Cape Race before sinking. So the radio gave them all the communication they needed and it worked just fine, amplifiers or not. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is just to refresh your memory. I'm sure you know most of this, but uh, she started off up in Belfast on the 2nd of April. It has a few, some sea trials out here. Incidentally, in the sea trials, of course, they tried things like high speed turns and, and so forth. And uh, uh, Smith was delighted with her performance and said, well, she turns on a sixpence. But of course, if your ship is 883 feet long and weighs 50 plus thousand tons, uh, it's a pretty large sixpence. And uh, anyway, it's a bit ironic. So they came down the coast um, uh, around Ireland, uh, stopped in Southampton for, uh, I think, three days because they had to they load with coal, load with fresh food and load on most of the passengers. Quick trip over to Cherbourg, picked up a few more passengers, uh, a quick stop in Queenstown uh, to let a few people off. The one picture which exists of the uh, radio room of the Titanic uh, was taken by a Father Brown who got off there, but it was a double exposure and it, it's, a, it's a pretty poor picture. Sadly, there's probably any number of other pictures of the uh, 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 radio room of the Titanic, but of course they're all down with the ship. And they came across and, and their denouement was there. And it, it, of course, this is Iceberg Alley because the ice is almost all shed from Greenland. And so it, 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 it anyway, there's a current that pulls it right down. If you go to Newfoundland, um, I'll tell you one of the most beautiful things you can see is the icebergs going by when the sun is out and they're like gigantic diamonds all glittering and blindingly white or blue white. Uh, anyway, pretty to look at, not fun to run into. Um, Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, here's two ch chaps who figure importantly. Uh, Captain Smith, 
Uh, he had been a White Star captain for many years, very experienced. Had, he had a perfect record up until his previous command, which was the Olympic, the, the sister ship of the Titanic, which was made from the same schematic uh, in um, schematic. Sorry, I'm thinking about radios, uh, the same blueprints as the Titanic the year before. The, the Olympic uh, was uh, set to sea on the, in the summer of 2011 and he had been the captain. And uh, he, uh, uh, he had one blemish on his record and that was that on the, the, the trip, the last trip of the Olympic before he transferred to the Titanic, they collided with another ship. I don't know the details, whether it was his fault or not, but other than that, he had a, a, an unblemished record and he was highly thought of. This other fellow here, Bruce Ismay, he's, uh, I'm calling him the CEO. I think he was called the general manager at the time, but anyway. And some people called him the owner of the Titanic. I don't know if there's any truth in that, whether he actually owned it or a big part of it. Uh, be a pretty expensive thing to buy, I would imagine. Um, anyway, he was on the, the trip there. And on, I believe the 13th, a couple of days before the, the disaster, uh, he and Captain Smith had lunch in the first class dining room. And for a number of reasons we don't, and of course, a, a number of people who survived uh, uh, kind of listened over, oh, you know, the captain and the owner, uh, wonder what they're gonna talk about. Also, we know some of the important things they said because uh, Smith changed the uh, standing orders he had given the bridge. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, okay, I actually I go back. I think I'll say just a bit more about this one. And uh, the part of the conversation we know about is that uh, they sat down and said hello and so forth. And, and uh, 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 Ismay asked uh, Captain, well, are we on schedule? And the captain said, yes, we're exactly on schedule. We should uh, arrive in New York on the, uh, this particular afternoon. I forget what the date was, certainly after the 15th. Uh, we're gonna arrive, we should arrive in the afternoon just as uh, was planned and just as we've advertised. And, and Ismay said, well, well, that's, that's all very well, that's nice. But I would really love to uh, uh, get there the day before. That would really be great publicity. And also, if we try to get there the day before, we have a good chance of being the fastest trip across the Atlantic. And this is a contest which has gone on for a long time from way back in the, the 19th century. Uh, you know, as ships got faster and better, people got across the Atlantic in less time. And uh, it became a big deal, especially with the big uh, transatlantic uh, uh, cruise ships and uh, uh, what's the word I want? Uh, liners. And it, it, it went up into the, uh, the 1950s and, and the time kept getting shorter and shorter as they could build uh, up greater and greater speed. Anyway, they had a chance to really wow everybody. And Ismay was pushing the, the uh, Smith, but Smith was apparently reluctant because what, what, his, the, what his running orders were that they would uh, run it at close to top speed, 22 to 24 knots uh, in the day, but he didn't like running at high speed in the dark. And so at night was 14 to 15 knots. And that was, that was the standing orders. But Ismay, one way or another, well, they were in a curious relationship, of course, because uh, Smith is absolute commander of the ship. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are, he's the captain. And when it comes to ship safety and, and, and so forth, his is the decision that rules. But on the other hand, um, Ismay was his boss. Uh, so once they were off the ship, uh, the, the shoe was on the other foot. However, it, it worked out. Uh, oh, and also Smith was, this was going to be his last assignment. He was going to retire after the Titanic. I don't know if it was to be after one round trip to uh, New York and back to uh, England or whether it was going to be you know, some weeks or months, but anyway. This was going to be his last command. He was going to retire. A anyway, Ismay convinced him. So he changed the orders to the bridge. They were going to run at the same high speed at night, uh, 22 to 24 knots. Okay, we go on now. Okay, next slide. There we go. Yeah. So this is essentially uh, a number of things which I think are, are important to know about what influenced uh, the fate of the Titanic and, and, and uh, perhaps who, <laughs> at whose feet we can lay it. Uh, so uh, in that period, uh, 10th to the 14th of April, it was 250 trivial passenger micrograms sent, 
plus the routine shift traffic. So the, the guys were busy. And uh, there was um, early on, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Smith received a number of general comments about the ice up ahead. And Smith would have known just where, because I mean, this route, this route across the North Atlantic was one he'd done many, many times before. Uh, and now there's a couple of other things. At 9.50, a message was sent, we are stopped and surrounded by ice from Cyril Evans, the uh, Marconi operator on the California. And at that point, uh, the California was uh, probably 75 or 100 miles uh, ahead of the Titanic, but on the, in, the, in the same uh, uh, route across the Atlantic. Uh, now, at 11.50, the, the Berg was sighted and reported by Titanic lookouts, exactly 10.11.50. And uh, the official number, I think this is correct, because it's been off a little bit, is that 37 seconds later, the Titanic strikes the, the Berg. Uh, what they do know is that the, the, the professional lookouts, because the, the, being a lookout was a profession, and, and they, you had to have the sharpest eyes and be able to stay awake and, and be able to estimate distances very accurately. It was uh, that when they first saw the iceberg, I mean, this is, uh, of course, the middle of the night and no moon, and there was mist. There was a fair amount of mist around, which you would expect because the icebergs were uh, cooling the air. And uh, so a little mist form. And they were going 22 and a half knots. So uh, if you take these numbers, it was 37 seconds between when the uh, lookouts first saw the iceberg and when they hit it. And if you just do the arithmetic here, uh, it's 45 seconds. Well, whether it was 37 or 45, immediately what the uh, lookouts, uh, they're up in a little crow's nest on the four, uh, four mast about, I think, 60 or 70 feet up above the deck. And they had a telephone and they had a, a button which would flash a light and ring a bell in, in the on the bridge. So they, they flashed, they rang the bell and somebody picked up the uh, receiver of the phone right away and, and the tight tank said, we're headed dead for an iceberg. So the, uh, the crew on the bridge did uh, immediately uh, what they should have done. And that was they uh, instantly swung the uh, wheel hard port because the, uh, uh, iceberg was more on the starboard side and they immediately called the engine room and told them to shut the engine down but as you can imagine three gigantic steam engines uh don't turn off uh going at this high speed don't turn off like your ignition switch does in your car and uh, they uh and the titanic began to swing but as we all know now the the, the berg just grazed it and just cut the, the slice of death down the side and more than uh, five compartments were opened. And, and the Titanic was believed to be unsinkable because you could actually uh, cut holes in up to five of, I think it was about 12 or 14 compartments in the ship and it, it wouldn't sink. It, it would be in tough shape with five compartments flooded, but it wouldn't sink. Uh, anyway, uh, at uh, first at 11.58, uh, uh, Captain Smith visits the radio room and he said, uh, don't do anything now, but, but be ready to send a distress message. Um, uh, uh, the, the Titanic's been damaged and uh, I've got to make an inspection to see what's, I think it's what's been done to her. Uh, he came back at 1214. He said, uh, send the message. What will you send? And, and uh, Philip said, uh, CQD, sir. And that's what he did. He sent CQD, CQD, DE, MGY. MGY, of course, was the call of the Titanic and gave the latitude and longitude. He sent it six times <clears throat> and immediately got all sorts of responses and there was extensive traffic. Uh, the Carpathia had been transmitting. This is one of the problems. They're all more or less on the same frequency. Uh, they might be a little bit off. There was no accurate way to measure the frequency other than a crude wave meter wave meter, which they all carried. Uh, and so Carpathia calls Titanic without knowing that she's in distress and says, Cape Cod has messages for you. And that would actually be the Syasconset station down here. Actually, Syasconset's on Nantucket. It's not on Cape Cod, but that's that's trivial. Uh, anyway, it said Cape Cod has messages for you. And Titanic come back and doesn't quite say to hell with the messages, but they say, come at once. We have struck Berg, a Berg. It's a CQD. And by the way, um, CQD is just, perhaps you all know this, but 
it's just what you'd expect it to be. It's, they use CQ in exactly the way we use it today. And uh, so it's just CQ distress. And uh, so everybody knew it. And so uh, actually at that point, uh, the two operators, uh, as, I, as I was saying, uh, uh, the junior op uh, was awakened just at the moment, point where Titanic was uh, struck the Berg. And so they were talking about it. And, and he kind of said jokingly, uh, well, Jack, why don't you send some of that new, that new uh, emergency call, SOS, just you might not have a chance again. And they were laughing about this. And so he did. Uh, and uh, the last signal was heard at 2.17 on the 15th. And uh, uh, Phillips stayed at the key. Literally, uh, the water was coming in the door. Actually, uh, the, the uh, assistant op uh, uh, bride went back and forth with half a dozen, dozen messages to uh, relaying to Smith what uh, the approaching ships that were trying to come and help them, uh, uh, what they said, how close they were and the speed they were going and when they expected to arrive and so forth. So he was running around out in the deck where there was mass confusion. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, finally Smith came down and, and, and Phillips just stayed at the key. And, and, and when Bride got back, he'd, he'd go into the room and, and the voltages, voltage started to drop. That is the 110, 100, 110 volts DC from the ship began to drop. So uh, Bride had to go in there and, and there was a number of adjustments you could make. The field, field adjustments on the motor and the uh, alternator, the uh, uh, spark gap settings on the disc discharger, a couple of other things. So he kept going in to try to optimize the signal out. So literally uh, the uh, uh, ship was transmitting up till about three minutes before it sank. They, you know, like, uh, and uh, Phillips way overstayed. Oh, Smith came and said to Phillips, uh, you've done your job, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you can leave now, save yourself. And Phillips kept on for another 10 minutes um, actually, a bride had already left, and he kept on going. And the, literally, the water was washing, washing around his feet. And then, just at that moment, the, the dynamos down below quit. And so, oddly enough, before he left, the, I mean, the ship was clearly sinking. Uh, there was no power, but he went in, and he was trained that there's a big knife switch in there. I didn't actually. I probably should have pointed out in the. Um, silent room. So we reached around the corner, he pulled it open. And, and we know he did because it's that way today. It's, you can see it. He, he, he pulled it open before he left because that was proper procedure. And, uh, and out he went. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, now you, you hear this story and of course it's, it's kind of heartbreaking. And so uh, like most people, I guess I, I sat down and looked at the if onlys, you know, how could this have been different? Uh, and there's a couple of interesting things. One was a ship, the SS Masaba, which sent a me message to MGY, to Titanic, stopped, sea packed with ice. Uh, but there's a very important part of, of the Marconi gram form, and it's the prefix. And the prefix determines who the message goes to. And uh, he had prefixed it with ice report. Now, if you want something to go to the captain, the only prefix you should use is MSG, message. And this is basically message for the captain. Well, uh, Phillips was pounding away there and extremely tired by now. He'd been up either fixing the radio or, or doing his, his uh, job, uh, sending messages and receiving messages for 36 hours straight. And so he saw this ice report. And I'm sure if he was a little uh, less exhausted, he would have realized that this really should go to the captain. This is, this is uh, you see, 750. This, this is uh, uh, almost uh, four hours, four hours before the ship struck the but he just stuck it under his left elbow, his right hand as we sat with his right, and things that he would deal with later went under his left elbow. And, and so, uh, by the way, when they copied, they just copied right onto the Marconi message form, and that's what he did. Uh, but it was there because it was an ICE report, not MSG. And I'm sure that uh, Smith, if he saw stopped sea packed with ice, would say, well, we can't be uh, running in the dark at high speed in a sea packed with ice. And that probably would have, uh, they'd have slowed the ship down. And later on, uh, there's a, another operator, Cyril Evans on the Californian. And at this point, the Californian was only about uh, uh, 50 or 60 miles away. And it was sail men were stopped and surrounded by ice. And 
So Phillips, again, he was slaving away on all these, these passenger messages. And he just sent da da dit da da dit da da dit da da dit which is uh, uh, that in the Marconi system, the faster ships had the message priority. In other words, if, if, if your ship could go faster than the other guy's ship, then you got priority on sending messages because the faster ships had less time to make money sending the passenger uh, Marconi grams. And uh, it, it ended up in the newspapers as uh, shut up, but it wasn't, it wasn't rude. It was, uh, that was the reality of the system. And uh, Phillips was just, that was, that was the correct response to send. But on the other hand, uh, Evan sent it, you see, with an SOM we are stopped and surrounded by ice. And, and uh, they knew that the, the Californian was ahead of them, not that far. And uh, SOM is say old man. And this, you only use this when you're sending a personal message uh, to the other operator. So an SOM never gets beyond the other operator. So this never got to the captain. And uh, you know, flying along in the dark, I'm sure, again, that if Smith had seen, we are stopped and surrounded by ice up ahead, he'd say, well, we, we can't go flying along at 24 knots in these conditions, but he never saw it. Uh, here's another one that uh, Cyril Evans, again, uh, he'd been on duty since seven in the morning. Uh, and this is this one reason they wanted 24-hour uh, regulation uh, for sh uh, large ships at sea. He was, um, he was the only operator on the Californian and he'd been working since 7 a.m. They'd been quite busy and he was beat. So after this DDD, I am working Cape Race, he got from Phillips. He did a little bit more than he went to bed. Uh, he, was, he was tired. And uh, it's interesting because he went to bed at 1135. All these numbers came out in, in the first the US Senate uh, investigation. And then of course, in, in the uh, uh, boards of inquiry from Britain and the United States. Anyway, so he switched off and went to bed at 1135 p.m. And at 1150, the Titanic lookout sees the iceberg and, and 37 or 45 seconds later, they're, they've, they're smashed. Uh, and at that point, the California was 11 miles from uh, the uh, uh, Titanic. And <clears throat> now uh, another thing that happened was that uh, Phillips, of course, uh, began sending the CQD as soon as he was given permission by uh, Captain Smith. He was heard by many distant ships and uh, on the Californian, now uh, Cyril Evans, the operator was sleeping in the sack, but uh, there was a third officer who of course formerly had nothing to do with the radio station, but he was very interested in radio, a potential ham, I suppose. And he was a third officer, a young fellow. And so uh, he, he goes in, he's off duty. So he says, well, let me see if I can hear some stuff. And so he goes in, and as I said before, the receiver is always on. There's no, nothing, to, nothing to turn on other than the magnetic detector, which is clockwork. And so he goes in there and he doesn't know how to start the magnetic clockwork. And when he's sitting there at 1220, uh, Phillips on the Titanic 11 miles away is continuously calling CQD, CQD. Uh, and if he would pulled that little lever on the, if Groves had pulled the little lever on the side of the Maggie, the magnetic detector, it would have started, and uh, uh, at that distance, as a matter of fact, uh, Evans, uh, when he got a call from the Titanic, he had to take the headphones off and put them down on the bench about five feet away because, of course, it was so loud. And no volume control. There's no automatic gain control. It just, at that distance, there was so much power coming into the uh, the antenna that it was, it was deafening. But uh, he didn't... Uh, Groves didn't know to pull the, the little lever to start the clockwork going and the little soft iron wire from ro rotating. And so uh, that was it, he wasn't heard. Uh, now another one, which uh, uh, this, the Captain Lord was the captain of the Californian and uh, he had gone to bed and the watch at uh, between 12.30 and uh, uh, two, uh, two in the morning, just before the, the, Cal the uh, Titanic sank, uh, uh, saw uh, they saw the Titanic or they saw uh, some ship with a lot of lights on. And then they saw some rockets taking off from the ship and rockets, uh, all large ships at the time would have carried rockets for uh, distress. And so they woke up the captain who I think wasn't very happy about it. And uh, he, uh, Captain Lord, he came out and he looked, and he said, oh, I, 
that's not the Titanic. I don't, the, the ship, the shape is not right. That is not the Titanic. I don't know what ship it is. And as far as the rockets, he said, well, it's one of those big liners and they're probably just having a party and they're just sending off rockets for fun. So he went back to bed and uh, nothing could be done. I've read a recent paper in which um, a bunch of meteorologists got together and, and said that uh, like the heat induced mirages in the desert, uh, still cold air over still cold water gives uh, a cold water mirage. And, and they present quite a convincing case that this is what happened. The Titanic didn't look right from 11 miles away because of cold water mirages due to these big, well, enormous chunks of ice standing around in an almost calm ocean with no wind. Oh, next page. Oh, I oh, just you know, went back, there we go. Okay, a last couple of uh, if onlys. Uh, uh, the TX broke, so Phillips was exhausted because he and, and, and uh, Bride had to fix it. Uh, if that hadn't happened, he would have had a night's sleep or at least five or six hours of sleep. And he might have really looked at those messages about the ice and said, this has got to go to the captain and history would be different. Uh, okay, oh, uh, and this, this picture down here, actually, uh, this is, uh, actually, maybe what I'll do is, I won't talk about this now, we'll go on and I'll explain it in a little while. Okay, uh, let's go to the next one. Okay, this is just an example. This, this is a Marconi gram <clears throat> originating on the uh, Olympic. Uh, and, and so you can see up at the top here, Olympic, uh, April 14th, uh, 24 two. And uh, now this is done correctly. You see prefix down here. This is the all important one. So you, it's the, you see MSG message. So this, this meant that the, uh, uh, this is actually Captain Haddock. There's a sailor's name for you uh, of the uh, Olympic sent this to commander Titanic. So this of course did get to uh, Smith because it had MSG instead of SOM or, or ice or whatever in there, which uh, didn't get to, to Smith. Uh, Okay, that's that's enough for that. Next one. Okay, and this this is um, uh, what's called collapse uh, collapse. These are these collapsible boats. And, and another part of the tragedy, which is sad, is that uh, uh, this this collapsible boat uh, had a capacity of sixty four people. Uh, it would be pretty darn crowded. But if you count them up, there's only twenty nine in the boat. And this was typical of almost all the lifeboats. So that. Not all the lifeboats got used, but uh, all the ones that were possible to use, but they didn't, uh, they didn't fill them up. Well, there was mass confusion on, on deck. And so when they got enough people, they got, just got it over the side because they didn't want to be caught, drawn down with the suck, suction of the Titanic when it sank. But, uh, you know, in calm sea, it would take 74. So the boat had less than half the people that it could have contained. And this was true of virtually all of the, the lifeboats. So there was a, a really unnecessary loss because if you weren't in the boat, hypothermia, the water was very close to zero degrees centigrade and might even have been a bit below next to the iceberg because uh, seawater doesn't freeze till minus two centigrade. And so anyway, it was pretty darn cold and the human body can't stand that drain of heat for very long. Okay, next uh, next slide. Here's two more. This, this is the conventional uh, lifeboat and there's uh, another collapsible there. And again, you look at them and there's nowhere near 64 people in either of those. Uh, next. Well, the, those of course were all taken from the uh, Carpathia, the rescue ship. It took the Carpathia uh, four hours after the sinking of the Titanic to get there. So anybody in the water, uh, they virtually all died is, is, of, of hypothermia. And this is, uh, Women and children first was, was uh, the thing in the day. And so almost everybody was a uh, female or a child. And, and th this is on the deck of the Carpathia. Okay, next. And this was some time after the April 21st. And uh, this is a ship out of Halifax, our Halifax, which is about a hundred kilometers from where I'm speaking. Uh, it, it actually is a cable ship that was laying cables between North America and, and Britain. And it came out and recovered 340 of the bodies. And uh, many of them are in a cemetery in Halifax that, that actually uh, Helen's family, my wife's family has uh, relatives in it. And we've been in a number of times and see these sad little gravestones, uh, unidentified child and so forth, Titanic 1912. Uh, next. 
Next slide. Here we go. Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I'll put this picture in twice, but this is the collapsible B. And uh, this was the one that uh, uh, when uh, Harold Bride, uh, <clears throat> uh, Phillips said uh, right towards the end, he said, go, 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 go. I'll, I'll just keep running. I'll just keep sending until the, uh, the power fails. And so <clears throat> Bride, uh, he never saw Phillips again alive, but he ran out and there was mass confusion on the deck. He uh, uh, went down and this boat was inverted and uh, there was a bunch of non-sailors trying to put it up the other way. And as you can imagine, it was pretty heavy and they couldn't do it. And, and uh, so Bride went to help them. And just at that moment, a wave washed up the deck. The, the, the Titanic was within a couple of minutes of sinking. And uh, he and most of the other people in the boat were all washed into the water and he, he got stuck under the boat and uh, he finally got out and uh, he floated around in the water for a while. And, and the hypothermia first, it's, uh, you, get, you, you lose your focus, you lose your, your mental acuity and you just kind of, uh, and so he was three quarters dead when uh, somebody on this, he swam and swam towards it and it got close enough so somebody on it was able to, to pull him up. Uh, and uh, he didn't know at the time, he was barely alive and awake, but uh, uh, Phillips was on the other end. Uh, and uh, he, he was, he'd slid off and he was floating in the water and uh, somebody had hold of his collar, but they didn't have the strength to pull him back up on it. So the difference between uh, living and dying was that uh, Bride was actually out of the water. And, and so he didn't get quite such an, so much uh, loss of heat and, and uh, Phillips was in it. So when this, they eventually got beside the Carpathia, um, everybody walked off uh, uh, Bride's feet uh, became frozen and he had a very painful time, but he, as he passed, he looked down and he said, oh, that's Phillips, the, the body floating just beside it. Uh, anyway, at that point, they weren't, uh, uh, they weren't trying to rescue any bodies. They just were very, very anxious to get everybody living off, which makes perfect sense. So uh, Phillips just floated away from collapsible B and that, that was the end of them. Okay, next slide. Uh, and here's, Bride, actually, even then he was exhausted. So they took him down below deck and gave him some whiskey and, and, and put him in the little of the ship's hospital and, and uh, warmed him up. But uh, he slept for most of the 15th, but late in the 15th, somebody came down and shook him awake and said, uh, uh, you got to help us. The, uh, there was, of course, a ton to do on the wireless of the Carpathia and another Marconi setup. And the Harold caught him, the uh, uh, operator there, he'd been working for 30 odd hours. And they said, you got to do something. He's acting queer. And so he, he uh, anyway, so Bride went down uh, and uh, he, he spent the rest of the time uh, in the operating till they got into New York. Uh, next. And so these, these are the, the fellows I've been discussing. Here's this uh, third officer who, uh, if only he pulled the little lever on the magnetic detector uh, and of course, if he could copy enough code to know CQD, uh, could have changed everything. Because at 11 miles from the Titanic, the uh, uh, Californian could have gotten there. Well, it, there's a lot of ice, so it might have been quite slow. But uh, if they could have gotten there within uh, two and a half hours, they could have gotten people off the Titanic who might not even have gotten their feet wet. Uh, if they'd been even within three hours, there was a probably a great number of people they could have rescued out of the water, but uh, it wasn't to be. And then Cyril Evans, there's the, uh, the fellow who got the, the uh, DDDD and, and went to bed at just the wrong time. And here's Harold Cotton, the, the operator on the Carpathia that uh, uh, took the messages which directed the Carpathia back to rescue the, the people from the Titanic and uh, eventually, eventually went queer after 36 hours at the key. Uh, next. Next slide, there we go. And this is at the, the, the first of the things I had to go through was the Senate hearings. And uh, there's um, Bride and, and there's um, Cotton. Um, uh, there's, I got some references at the end. If you're interested, you can simply Google uh, and uh, get the testimony for the Senate hearing. So you can hear the exact words, what uh, the survivors had to say, that the deck officers that survived, uh, Lord of the, uh, uh, Californian, uh, Cotton and Bride and, and the other people there. It's, it's interesting to he 
hear exactly what's said in their own words because there's so much rubbish been written about the, the uh, uh, death of the Titanic that at least if you hear it from the mouths of the people who had just experienced it, you know, you could probably believe that. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, this is uh, uh, on April 19th, 1912, uh, just a few days after, remember, she sank on the 15th. Uh, the, the, of course, it was a, a huge story. And so the New York Times got uh, uh, a bride to agree to an interview, actually. And then, then of course, he had to get uh, Marconi to agree. And so uh, what I actually have I'm holding in my hand is, I don't expect you to read this. Uh, I've got a copy of what he said uh, in his article in the New York Times uh, with his uh, ultimate boss sitting right beside him, I should say. And in fact, he, he did leave out uh, a couple of more uh, lurid things which happened. And I'll mention afterwards, but I guess uh, Marconi, of course, was interested in, in the good name of his company and, and no blame being ascribed to his operators or his equipment. So this is what, uh, this is what uh, uh, Harold Bride, the assistant operator, had to say uh, himself. Uh, okay, the following thrilling statement was dictated today by Mr. Bride, the assistant Marconi operator on board the Titanic to the New York Times representative in the presence of Mr. Marconi, who is now staying in New York. I joined the Titanic at Belfast. I was born in Nunhead, London, Southeast, 22 years ago, and joined the Marconi staff last July. I first worked on the Haverford, then on the Lusitania, and was transferred to the Titanic at Belfast. I didn't have much to do aboard the Titanic, except to relieve Phillips, the senior operator, from midnight until some time in the morning when he finished sleeping. There were three rooms in the wireless cabin. One was a sleeping room, one a dynamo room, in one, the operating room. I took off my clothes and went to sleep in the bed, the bed. I think they were hot bunking. That is that since one of them had to be on duty all the time, then they only, between them, they only needed one bed. Uh, then I was conscious of waking up and hearing Phillips sending to Cape Race. I read what he was sending. It was only routine matter. I remembered how tired he was and got out of bed without my clothes on to relieve him. I think what he means is without his Marconi uniform on. Uh, I don't even, I didn't even feel the shock. I hardly knew what had happened until after the captain had come to us. There was no jolt, whatever. This is the encounter with the iceberg. I was, I was standing by Phillips, telling him to go to bed, and the captain put his head in the cabin. We've struck an iceberg, the captain said, and I'm having an inspection made to tell what it, ha what it has done for us. You had better get ready to send out a call for assistance, but don't send it until I tell you. The captain went away, and in 10 minutes, I should estimate, he came back. We could hear terrible confusion outside, but not the least thing to indicate any trouble. The wireless was working perfectly. Send a call for assistance, ordered the captain, barely putting his head in the door. What call should I send, Phillips asked. The regulation international call for help, just that. Then the captain was gone. Phillips began to send CQD. He flashed away at it, and we joked while he did so. All of us made light of the disaster. We joked that we joked that way while we flashed the signals for about five minutes. Then the captain came back. What are you sending? He asked. CQD, Phillips replied. The humor of the situation appealed to me, and I cut in with a little remark that made us all laugh, including the captain. Said S send SOS, I said. It's the new call, and it may be your last chance to send it. Phillips, with a laugh, changed the signal to SOS. The captain told us we had been struck amidships or just after midships. It was 10 minutes. Phillips told me after he noticed the iceberg, but the slight jolt was the only signal to us that a collision had occurred. We thought we were a good distance away. We said lots of funny things to each other in the next few minutes. We picked up the first steamship, Frankfurt, gave her our position and said we had struck an iceberg and needed assistance. The Frankfurt operator went away to tell his captain, he came back and we told him we were sinking by the head and that we could observe a distinct list forward. The Carpathia answered our signal and we told her our position and said we were sinking by the head. The operator went to tell the captain and in five minutes returned and told us the Carpathia was putting about and heading for us. Our, key, our captain had left us at this time and Phillips told me to run and tell him what the Carpathia had answered. I did so and went through an awful mass of people to his cabin. The decks were full of scrambling men and women. I came back and heard Phillips giving the Carpathia further directions. Phillips told me to put on my clothes. 
Until that moment, I forgot I wasn't dressed. I went to my cabin and dressed. I brought an overcoat to Phillips. As it was very cold, I slipped the overcoat upon him while he worked. Every few minutes, Phillips would send me to the captain with little messages. They were merely telling how the Carpathia was coming our way and giving her speed. I noticed as I came back from one trip that they were putting off women and children in lifeboats and the list forward was increasing. Phillips told me the wireless was growing weaker. The captain came and told us our engine rooms were taking water and the dynamos not, might, might not last much longer. We sent that word to the Carpathia. I went out on deck and looked around. The water was pretty close to the boat deck. That is the top deck they were on. There was a great scramble aft and how poor Phillips worked through it, I don't know. He was a brave man. I learned to love him that night, and suddenly I felt for him a great reference to see him standing there, sticking to his work while everybody else was raging about. I will never live to forget the work Phillips did for the last awful 15 minutes. Phillips clung on, sending and sending. He clung on for about 10 minutes or maybe 15 after the captain released him. The water was then coming into our cabin. From aft came the tunes of the ship's band playing the ragtime tune, Autumn. Phillips ran aft, and that was the last I ever saw of him alive. I went to the place where I'd seen the collapsible boat on the boat deck, and to my surprise, uh, the men were still trying to push it off. I guess there wasn't a sailor in the crowd. They couldn't do it. I went up to them and was just lending a hand when a large wave came awash of the deck. The big wave carried the boat off. I had hold of an oarlock, and I went off with it. The next thing I knew, I was in the boat. But that wasn't all. I was in the boat and the boat was upside down and I was under it. I can remember realizing I was wet through and whatever happened, I must breathe for I was underwater. I knew I had to fight for it and I did. I got out from under the boat, I don't know how, but felt a breath of air at last. There were men all around me, hundreds of them. The sea was dotted with them, all depending on their life belts. I felt I simply had to get away from the ship. She was a beautiful sight then, smoke and sparks, were rushing out of her funnels. There must have been an explosion, but we heard none. We only saw a big stream of sparks. The ship was gradually turning on her nose, just like a duck goes that goes down for a dive. I had only one thing in my mind, to get away from the suction. The band was still playing, and I guess all the band went down. They were heroes. They were playing Autumn. Then I swam with all my might. I suppose I was 150 feet away when Titanic on her nose, with her after quarter sticking straight up in the air, began to settle slowly. When at last the waves washed over her rudder, there wasn't the least bit of suction I could feel. She must have kept going down just as flowing as she had been. It felt after a little while like sinking. I was very cold. I saw a boat of some kind near me and put all my strength into an effort to swim to it. It was hard work and I was all alone when a hand reached out of the boat and pulled me aboard. It was our same collapsible boat with the same crowd on it. There was just room for me to roll on the edge. I lay there not caring what happened. Somebody sat on my legs. They were wedged in between some slats and were being wrenched. I hadn't the heart left to ask the man to move. There was a terrible sight all around, men swimming and sinking everywhere. I saw some lights off in the distance and knew a steamship was coming to our aid. I didn't care what happened. I just lay and gasped when I could and felt the pain in my feet. I feel it still. At last, the Carpathia was alongside and the people were being taken up a rope ladder. Our boat drew near and one by one, the men were taken off it. One man was dead. I passed him and went to, la went to a ladder, although my feet pained me terribly. The dead man was Phillips. He died on the raft from exposure and cold. I guess he'd been all in from work before the wreck came. He stood his ground until the crisis passed and then collapsed. But I hardly thought of that then. I didn't think much of anything. I trove tried the rope ladder. My feet pained me terribly, but I got to the top and felt hands reaching out to me. The next I know, knew a woman was leaning over me in a cabin and I felt her hand waving in my hair and rubbing my face. I felt somebody at my feet and felt the warmth of liquor. Somebody got me under the arms and I was carried down below to the hospital. That was early in the day. I guess I lay in hospital till near night when they told me that the Carpathia's wireless man was acting queer and would I help. After that, I was never out of the wireless room, so I don't know what happened to the passengers. Okay, that's his, that's his interview with the New York Times. Uh, and actually, uh, there was one good thing that came out of it for him, that the New York Times paid him $1,000 for the interview. And uh, that was several years pay on, uh, at the pay rate he was at. So 
Uh, one good thing for him at least. Uh, okay, next slide. Okay, so now you come to the question, so what did the Titanic disaster do to radio? Uh, you can look at what the bare facts, 710 people were saved. If, if they hadn't had a radio or if the radio had been defective, um, there's no reason to believe that any ship would have found them before everybody was, was dead. Uh, the radio operators, uh, all the radios performed perfectly for this, other than the earlier failure on the Titanic, which really wasn't part of the, of the rescue, of course. <clears throat> anyway, the operators all performed well or heroically, Cyril Evans, um, Harold Cottom, Jack Phillips, Bride, and so forth, uh, and the other ROs on shore. The picture down here is, of course, from a, a newspaper of the time that <clears throat> shows the uh, 10 ships all heading towards the Titanic. Uh, the directions from which they're coming are, are all imaginary. They just, they're there to, so they can fit all the ships in. But uh, it, uh, the, the wireless certainly worked and other people were certainly listening and, and uh, uh, it, at least it saved the 710. But on the other hand, 1,514 people died. Uh, next slide. So uh, to the International Telecommunications Union, you, you may know that it's been around since 1865. And the first thought is, well, uh, there wasn't much in the way of radio in 1865, but what there was, was that uh, telegraph or a land telegraph was becoming very popular because it was the first quote unquote instantaneous mode of communication. And in Europe, you had about 30 different countries speaking 30 different languages and uh, the system was kind of chaos. So uh, uh, the ITU formed and uh, basically organized the basis of telegraphy as, as it, it, uh, so everybody could talk to everybody else, common abbreviations, uh, common methods of, of uh, communication, common uh, message forms, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, so what they did also was that, it's interesting because if you look at the, the bureaucracy today, I would say they did a pretty good job back then because just six weeks after the Titanic sinking, the uh, US Senate hearing had been concluded. The American Board of Inquiry and the British Board of Inquiry had all concluded and all agreed on the facts and what had happened. And then the ITU sat down to see, well, what can we do to improve the situation? Uh, next slide. Okay, so what they came up with was national call sign assignments. In other words, if I'd been a ham in 1910, up here I might have been one Fox Alpha. And after the assignments, I was Victor Echo on Fox Alpha. And the same happened in every country. You, I, I don't know the details in Britain, but certainly uh, in the US, same thing. There, there's 3AB or, or 6TA or whatever, uh, no, nothing to indicate the country. Uh, they, they uh, standardized weather and time station frequencies. Uh, the Q codes, they came up with the Q codes. I'm not sure if Q codes were used at all before, but they became a standardized part. And if you know, back in the days of a lot of message relay, there was a much more extensive set of them than we use today. 24 radio watches were mandated for all larger ships with all sorts of regulations uh, around that to make sure they were effective. Uh, you had to pause in longer messages for emergency traffic. And the three minute silent period started then. You're probably all familiar with the, the classic radio clock here, where you've got from uh, 13 minutes, uh, 15 to 18 minutes after the hour, and from 45 to 48 minutes after the hour are the two three minute periods that if you were on 600 meters, where almost everybody was in those days, other than some of the military down at 300 meters, uh, you had to stop and listen for those two three. So uh, weak signals and, and distance signals could be heard and any appeals for uh, assistance could come at that time. Also, uh, what came a little bit later, but not much later, uh, you see the red bars. I don't know if you're all familiar with these, but this is the, the uh, uh, auto alarm signal. And what these are is that uh, by at least the mid twenties, I, I, I don't think they were before the twenties, uh, the devices called auto alarms came along and they were little dedicated receivers uh, vacuum tube receivers, so that would have been the 20s, of course, uh, with an uh, um, electromechanical device that recognized four four-second dashes uh, interspersed with one-second gaps. So uh, they put it on the, the clock, 
so that a, a nervous operator in a, a foundering ship, maybe he's got wa water washing around his shoes, uh, can just watch the second hand sweep by and he holds his key down for four seconds, lets it up for one second, another four up. Four of those would trigger the auto alarm and ships with an auto alarm, when it was triggered, the bells would go off and lights would go off, often in both the bridge and the radio operator's quarters. And the ship was alerted if somebody wasn't listening closely at that moment. And uh, they saved a lot of lives. The auto alarm was widely used in planes and ships in World War II. So essentially the uh, ITU, because of the Titanic, shaped uh, very a lot of the radio world that we, uh, we use today. Uh, and that, oh, and the, the other thing here is just, uh, this, this one happens to be in French, but this is when it all came out in the booklet, which everybody got in, in whatever language you preferred. But uh, the protocol final, uh, reglement de service, uh, the uh, adjustment of the regulations, London 1912. And uh, so, uh, basically, the bureaucrats did a very fine job, at, at least in that case, uh, because I say a lot of this is still still valid today. Uh, next slide. So after that was the Radio Act of 1912, which basically parroted the ITU. They, they, well, the U.S. of course was a member of the ITU, and so essentially in August 1912, still I mean we're still talking just a, a few months after the Titanic but it, it was all compatible with, with the ITU. And uh, they also said, for instance, that all radio stations and officers must, operators must be licensed because before that uh, you could just kind of get on and play around on the air. And uh, they decided that, was, that wasn't a good idea. It's all sea going vessels, 24 hour watch and, and so forth. Uh, the, the one at the end, which is, is famous in the States, I don't know if, if you had anything similar in Britain, but uh, it, uh, it said that private stations radio amateurs who, who were licensed got all frequencies from 200 meters and down. In other words, every fre frequency above 1.5 megahertz went to the amateurs because as everybody knew, they were useless. So, uh, and this is really one of the reasons that uh, short wave was discovered when it was because people started getting very interested in experimenting because they had this huge, uh, enormous spectrum, which was all amateur. Of course, this didn't last, but it was it was fun while it lasted. Uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, I just I always like to point who's this is my opinion. Uh, you know the the main things which caused the uh, the disaster. Uh, I think Bruce Ismay has to take some responsibility because if he hadn't pressured Smith to run fast night, if the uh, ship had been on exactly the same course with a, the iceberg in exactly the same position, if they were doing 14 or 15 knots instead of uh, 23 or 24, it would have given substantially more time. And the sinking was a, a very near thing because uh, uh, looking at the ship uh, on the, from deep diving submersibles has shown that, uh, anyway, it literally was just a light graze. It wasn't the side of the ship was caved in. It just barely touched the iceberg. Uh, and it's actually, it's ironic to think that if they hadn't turned at all, if they just charged straight into the iceberg, there would have been a God almighty crash and uh, the front of the Titanic would have been destroyed, but almost certainly uh, it wouldn't have flooded five compartments. There would have been two or three perhaps that were destroyed and the Titanic wouldn't have sunk, but they got just at just the right angle. It, it probably only, a yard or two further away from the, 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 the um, iceberg and uh, either nothing would have been uh, split open or maybe just one or two compartments, but uh, it was what it was. The improper message prefixes, the SOM and ICE report. Now th this is, these, uh, it, it's hard to say, but uh, the, the, uh, the SOM for instance from Cyril Evans, he should have said MSG so that uh, uh, the, uh, Captain Smith got a message that said the sea is packed with ice. And the failure of Captain Lord to investigate, he could have easily gotten uh, Evans out of bed to uh, listen on the radio, just say, well, is there, because the rockets are going up and rockets are a sign of distress. And, and he should have said, even if I think they're party rockets, uh, uh, we should just check to be sure. And he didn't. And of course, the failure of the regulations not requiring 24 hour monitoring for, for large ships at sea. Okay, uh, next please. 
Okay. So I guess my conclusion is that uh, the radio regu regulations enacted as a result of the Titanic disaster probably saved more lives over the, all the years and all of the ships at sea, uh, probably saved more lives than were lost in the Titanic because uh, the regulations were pretty sound, really. And they, they were used for a long time and saved a lot of people. Uh, next. Okay, these are just some references. If you want to look a little bit further into this, uh, uh, the, anyway, the, the information's here, so you can uh, look these up. Uh, I, I, I quote a number of these are AWA, and this is uh, the Antique Wireless, uh, boom, Antique Wireless Association, which is in New York State. And it's, it's actually, I belong for a number of years. It's a very interesting organization. They're serious historians of the history of radio, and, and their main objective is to preserve the history, not just a lot of old uh, dusty boxes. They do have a wonderful radio collection as well, but they got uh, they get excellent people in to speak. And so things in the AWA review are pretty scholarly. It's not just hearsay and so forth. So, uh, and there's a couple down here by Park Stevenson. Um, there's uh, some, I believe, mistakes on what he describes about the mechanism of the of the uh, the radio. He, he's he's not a he's not a ham or radio engineer, but he's he's a clearly talented guy, and they're still worth reading. Uh, next slide. Okay, here's a bit more. You can just Google Park Stevenson, you'll find out a lot, uh, or Sparks 401. And he made a movie with James Cameron as well, Titanic 20 years later, which isn't just about the radio, it's, it's uh, deep diving down there. This is interesting. If you want to look at this verbatim testimony of Bride, Marconi, Titanic officers, Lord, uh, and so forth, uh, you can just, just Google Titanic Inquiry Project and you'll get, uh, there was a Senator, I think it was Senator Smith actually, who uh, interviewed all these people for the inquiry and, and their re responses were taken down verbatim. And this was just a few days after the event. Uh, okay, that's it folks. I, I hope you got something out of it and that you're still more or less awake and uh, thank you for your attention. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Fred. Uh, that was a great follow on from your original talk. Yeah. Right. Um, who wants to um, go with a question or comment to Fred? Who wants to go first? I know a number of people did chip in on the chat um, and Fred did mention as well that uh, he uh, has got some links in there. I will put a link when I do my email tomorrow. I'll mm -hmm. put a link in to the PDF file of all Fred's slides tonight. So if you want to mm -hmm. go and find those links that he's referred to, you can see those. Uh, Darren, you were, you had your hand up. Yes, OK. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for a very, very interesting uh, talk. I think we've all seen the film on Titanic or various films, and uh, it's nice to hear the, the truth, as it were, rather than the myths. Uh, which is very, very uh, interesting. Uh, I've sailed over the site a couple of times and uh, also been to the graveyard in uh, in Halifax, which was, uh, well, even now I'm getting goosebumps just, uh, just thinking about it. But uh, it's interesting to see that a lot of the modern cruise ships still only run at about 24 knots. Um, so there hasn't been much change in there. And the other thing that always strikes me whenever I've been on several bridges of the modern cruise ships, they only now have VHF radios. Uh, and I've asked the question, there's no HF communication rely on VHF or mobile phones. Yes. Which, which considering the modern um, uh, theory regarding to solar flares, et cetera, uh, that's a little bit concerning. Yeah, I would say so. Of course, uh, today they have, uh, of course, radar and sonar and uh, Imarsat, uh, and, and anyway, the, uh, a ton of electronics, of course, that poor old Titanic didn't have. I mean, just just the, just the radar would have warned them well in advance about the icebergs and so forth. But on HF, yeah, it's, um, uh, well, of course, it's that way with modern passenger aircraft too, that uh, the last I knew that uh, 747 and what have you, Airbus had HF for uh, planes that were crossing the ocean. But if they weren't crossing an ocean, they didn't have any HF. I went once on the bridge of, I think it was um, Pino's Ventura, and I looked at the log and there was an SOS call. And uh, as soon as I looked at this log, they quickly shut it. I never got to see what was put in there. Yeah. 
Well, uh, as I'm sure you know that uh, 500 kilohertz, 600 meters was just retired. Oh, I'm, I'm not so good at remembering recent, I think about 15 years ago, something like that, 12 or 15 years ago, perhaps somebody knows more, but the uh, operators who still relied on it were very upset because they said that GPS, well, if, if the satellites get knocked down by accident or aggression, then you've lost your, your uh, best system. And the, the 500 kilohertz system with modern equipment uh, was, was very effective. Yeah. Sometimes the, the new doesn't overtake the old. Yeah. And the thing was that the old system was simple and cheap. I mean, all you needed was a, a, a very modest uh, transceiver that would work on 500 kilohertz. And uh, that was it. And there was shore stations in various places that you could contact. And, and especially with uh, some of the new digital modes, you don't need much power at all. To, to uh, With the new digital modes, it's relatively easy to work uh, uh, west coast of North America to Australia on 500 kilohertz. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Darren. Uh, anyone else with a question or comment to Fred? And if I don't see you, just uh, unmute yourself and go ahead. Can I? Yeah, Nick, can I? Can I? Yes, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Fred. Very interesting and, and a very good uh, follow up of your last presentation. Uh, just by accident, in our national journal here in Belgium, there were two articles about the Titanic. And, and one of the points which were mentioned was that actually Phillips, the radio officer, he uh, refused to talk to radio oper operators using Telefunken because that was the big uh, competition. And Markeny at that time had already a nearly monopoly position in, in this market. So mm. um, this is one of the things they mentioned in that article. For what it is true, eh? I, I haven't checked the sources of that. And then the second thing was that radio operators, what you call ham operators today, at that time were not licensed. They were unregulated. Yeah, that's right. And uh, they were spreading what we should call today fake news about what they hear on, on, on the air about the Titanic. So they spread fake news to, to the press, actually. And afterwards, the general public was uh, not happy about this. And this is one of the reasons why four months later, the US decided to get uh, these radio operators licensed and under the, under the 200 meters. I don't know if these two things are, you know, are correct or not. The, and they also said that that article that the name Ham is actually coming from the radio officers who said that these radio operators, private radio operators, were ham fisted on telegraphy. So the ham was coming from the ham fisted um, approach, the bad, the bad CW that they were uh, sending on the waves. So okay. these are two, you know. Things that yeah. are read today by accident. <laughs> well, you, you got another number of points there. Um, I don't know about Philip's bias about telephone, and I hadn't heard of that. The first ship that they, they, he talked back and forth to and who said they would come to their assistance was the Frankfurt, which one would presume had telephone equipment. Uh, but he would have known yeah. the telephone equipment just by its sound because he, he, each system had a different sound to it and, and often a different spark frequency. Mm -hmm. um, the business about Cape Race and the amateurs, that I believe is true, that there were some uh, amateurs that started, it, it was, they, they got excited because they, they heard a, a genuine disaster at sea. And so, yeah, as you know, we have some lids today, people that you really wish didn't have their amateur license. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was true then too. Well, I didn't have an amateur license. And, and I think that was one of the things that uh, there was a battle back and forth that, uh, the commercial interests in the military, especially the military, said we don't want to, in those days, signals were very broad, both transmitters and receivers. Mm -hmm. So uh, it wasn't as if you had a tiny two kilohertz slot, you were splashing over 50 or 100 or 200 kilohertz. So both the military, mostly the military in the, in the US didn't want any amateurs there. The origin of ham, uh, there's a bunch of stories about that. The, the other one is that uh, after World War I, uh, 1918 or 19, 
uh, there was a, a, a widespread movement by the military to uh, uh, disenfranchise hams. That they, 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 we don't, these people are taking up valuable space. We might need it someday. Uh, so there was three, there was a ham station at Harvard University in Boston, Massachusetts. And the three sort of most active hams there who were also apparently very bright Harvard students, um, their initials were H, A, and M. And they went down and they spoke to the Senate and they gave such a good speech that they convinced quite a few of the senators. Well, most people didn't understand much about radio at the time anyway, yeah. but they gave such a good speech that um, basically amateur radio was started. And uh, uh, Hiram Percy Maxim, who was yeah. Uh, yeah. the inventor of the machine gun and, and the originator of the American Radio Relay League, uh, <laughs> yeah. he's a diverse kind of guy. Uh, anyway, he. He got fired up and they started the ARRL and uh, the, the rest yeah. is history. But yeah, the, the, uh, back in the day, uh, there was a lot of, especially with before licensing, there was a lot of misbehavior. Anybody that could figure out how to buy or build a radio could put one on the air and do what they liked. And, and uh, we're perhaps lucky that the radios had such a limited range back then. <laughs> I will send you a copy of that article. It's in French also. Oh, okay. I can, yeah. Anyway, yeah, good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Roger, G4 UFZ. Hi, Fred. Thanks for that. Very interesting. Um, I wonder, because of the technology, the relays and things, were they speed limited on the speed they could send or whether there's a standard speed? And, you know, tell us something about the speeds they would use on, for sending. Well, um, there, there's actually, you can find it on the, the internet. There's a recording supposedly done at Cape Race on some kind of primitive recording equipment of the Titanic disaster and Phillips sending. And I've listened to it and I'm doubtful because it's got a slight musical note, doesn't sound like what they call the plain spark machines, but the musical note was 840 Hertz and it doesn't sound uh, from the machine on the Titanic and it doesn't sound that high. But if it is true and I mean, they didn't have very good recording stuff in those days, wax cylinders with a, a needle grinding into the wax and so forth. Uh, it, uh, it, it, uh, whoever is sending it is sending up to about uh, 24 or 25 words per minute. Wow. And, but my understanding before that, and as I say, I'm really doubtful as to whether it's true. It's the kind of thing somebody could have sat down and made uh, a fake you know, forgery of, um, that they sent slower, that... Uh, well, you can imagine there's a ton of natural atmospherics and lightning crashes and, and no amplifiers and, and uh, very broad because if you narrow down the receiver, uh, you lost most of your signal and you had no way to amplify it. It's, it's, yeah, so uh, I was so they, they sent the slower. I was thinking of the limitation of the relays as well because you said you're switching a relay that's oh, well, a spark gap that's switching a relay that's switching 600 volts or whatever. So it's... Uh, it's going to bound to go run slowly. Mechanical devices run slow. Yeah. Well, it's uh, you can you can look the thing up. At Marconi made the relay. They started without. They just did, they were using I don't know if you know what the what they call the GPO keys, the government post office keys in, in England were like big things with quite a heavy bar and a tall knob and so forth. Uh, the Marconi key looked like a government post office key. Uh, it was actually very clever because it had a second second set of contacts, and what it did was when you depressed the key and completed the circuit so the transmitter transmitted, uh, the second set of contacts shorted out your headphones. So you, you didn't get your earphones blown off your head every yeah, time yeah, you press the key. If, if you try to operate a relay faster, you do the spark across the relay contacts will just burn the relay out very quickly. Yeah. Well, uh, you can look at the relay that they used. It, it's a uh, uh, magnetic relay so that the key was only switching the solenoid of the relay. and uh, Actually, I haven't seen a clear picture of the contacts, but heavy currents through contacts, uh, they were well familiar with them at the time because there was uh, a, a number of other systems. There's a uh, what they call a Polson arc, which was another way to uh, fire up a radio. Uh, it, uh, it, it's got contacts that are all about the size of a, a nickel or what I think in Euro anyway, a good size coin, a, a couple of centimeters across with big heat fins coming out from it. But actually the key in the Titanic 
it was called a guillotine key because beside the lever which uh, you sent the code with, there was another lever. And now and again, if you were trying to switch the 17 amps, the two contacts would free, uh, seize together, they'd weld together. And so if you left the spark transmitter in transmit, uh, it, you'd, you'd burn up a lot of things very quickly. So the guillotine was a lever you could just pull up and it disconnected the first key. So you could basically uh, put, you, put yourself back and receive. You didn't say and transmit and burn up your radio. But yeah, it's so a good point. And all I can say is that they did use a big relay and uh, the, the, the five kilowatt uh, synchronous rotary spark was used by a lot of other ships. And it was a, it was, it was a state of the art for the time and it worked pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Proper engineering then, obviously. Pretty good. Yeah. Uh, actually, most of the Marconi stuff, when you looked at it closely, uh, is, is pretty well, given the state of the science and technology of the time, it's pretty good stuff. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, thanks. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, you're, Roger. you're very welcome. All right. Anyone else with a question or comment to, uh, to Fred? If not, yeah, yeah sorry, Adrian, did, were you waving at me? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> no, we my, were only a, bit, a little bit early. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no problem. No problem. Okay. Well, uh, can we? Who's yeah. that? Sorry, Terry. Uh, Nick. Terry, G3VFC. Um, that was a remarkably lucid storytelling, Fred. And uh, I'd just like to raise my hat if I had one. Um, thanks ever so much. Oh, well, thank Very you. Entertaining and enlightening. Absolutely brilliant. Well done. Mm. Well, yeah, can, um, we, can we show our appreciation to Fred? Let's give him a... a, a <laughs> very good indeed. Thank you, Fred. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm hoping that at least 90% of what I said was correct. That's my hope. <laughs> Who cares? It was a good story. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's actually... It's frustrating when you get different times and dates for the same event. And so who's right? You just have to look at a lot of sources and try to pick out what seems to be the consensus and the sources that you trust the most. Whereabouts are you, Fred? Um, we're, I'm in Nova Scotia. I'm uh, about 100 kilometers from Halifax. Okay, in, uh, yeah. uh, I'm in a, a farming area called the Annapolis Valley. Yeah, yeah I know roughly where you are. I like Halifax. Yeah. yeah. Well, this, you wouldn't probably want to be there right at the moment. We've uh, we dodged most of the COVID for a very long time. That in a province with a million people, there was a couple of dozen people that had had COVID. But then a few weeks ago, it, it arrived. And so we've got what, about 1,400 people now. But still, we, it hasn't been like, uh, you know, India or, or Montreal or any of the. I'm waving at you now, uh, Halifax Crystal. Oh, all right. Very good. <laughs> and, and what's in the Halifax Crystal? I, I oh, trust well, you have well, a local well, wine. Well, that that's a, no, it's a, it's a South African uh, pinotage, but I know they do do a design from the Titanic. Uh, I don't know, it's an actual replica. Oh, yeah. Anyway, you know, I was hoping it'll be local wine because uh, we used to grow nothing but apples here, and, and you Brits bought hundreds of thousands of barrels of Nova Scotia apples back before the Second World War, but uh, they're not so profitable now, so it's all been turned into vineyards. And so we're producing all kinds of wine now. Oh, excellent. Yeah. I'll, I must come again. Yeah, <laughs> right. Oh, brilliant. Well, look, Fred, thank you very much indeed for a, a great talk. Really enjoyed it. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll put the uh, film up on our YouTube channel tomorrow. I'll send you the link. And before you go, I did get an apology uh, members of our club will remember Brian um, W2RBJ from New York, um, who is in the East Greenbush Radio Club. And he's just written a book on the Titanic as well. I was mentioning this to Fred earlier. And uh, Brian, unfortunately, couldn't join us uh, this evening. But uh, he was telling me, and this is a complete coincidence that his book is going to be published by a publisher called Pen and Sword, who are based here in, in Yorkshire. And in fact, uh, they are the publishers 
of the Barnsley Chronicle newspaper. That will please everyone in Huddersfield. Uh, they publish uh, my local uh, my local paper, the Barnsley Chronicle, and it's their, their publishing house, Pen and Sword, that is publishing uh, Brian's book on the Titanic uh, very soon. So I've, I've said to Brian, um, he can either come along to one of our meetings at some stage and, and promote his book and just tell us a bit about it, um, or send send me a note and I'll circulate it round so people can see what uh, what he said. But uh, it is great uh, to uh, uh, to to have Fred here again tonight. And uh, Fred, I, I think we'll we'll get you back another time as well. Uh, one of the other conversations I was having with Fred uh, that he's also a restorer of old radios and uh, is particularly interested. We were talking earlier particularly interested in the uh, the Paraset radio that was uh, used in the Second World War uh, by the uh, special operations executive operators that, uh, that dropped into France uh, during World War II. Uh, so, uh, Fred, we, we'll get, I'm sure we'll get you back um, <laughs> and uh, it will be good to see you again. Okay, well, th well thank you very much, Nick. Uh, actually, I, I have to, slight correction there. It's um, I built a Paraset some years ago, but we're busy with the, the Mark III Tinker Box now from the, the same gang, the special, the communications, Section 8 is a communications division of MI6 back in, in the Second World War. And they, they, they designed this thing and it was widely used. It was used in all the embassies and it was used by agents in the field. And so anyway, a friend of mine and I are each building one. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to talk on that at some point. Brilliant. That would be that would be really good, Fred. Well, I'll I'll won't, I'll definitely pick you up on that yeah. uh, on that offer there. But but that one would probably be a real quickie, less than an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. All right, thank you, Fred. I'm just going to turn the recording off and just deal with a couple of other right. pieces of, uh, of news. So thank you, everyone, for coming along, and uh, uh, thank you to Fred again. Okay. Thank thanks again. I enjoyed.